and welcome back to Katie Draws. If this is a new channel to you, welcome. My name is Katie. On this channel, I like to do a lot of speed painting and we are also talking about goddesses and heroines from all across the globe at the same time. We're both learning about all of these amazing cultures and myths while we're getting a visualization of it. It's something that I like. So welcome to my channel. Uh, if this is something that actually interests you, the best way to support me is by liking and subscribing to my videos. It means a whole bunch to me. If you missed last week, we were talking about the Egyptian Nubian goddess, Anukit, who is the goddess of the Nile. So this week, we are going to actually talk about her counterpart, Cetus, and we're, we kind of already went over this a little bit last week, but Cetus, Anukit, and the god Kanum were all a part of this elephantine or elephantine triad. They were protectors of the Nile. This was during the time of the New Kingdom. And now as I'm talking about this, I'm realizing we're going to have to talk a little bit about Egyptian history, especially for Cetus because she's so old. So we have a, I mean, ancient Egypt is, it's so expansive. I mean, there's so much time that goes by. I mean, thousands and thousands of years. So we have lower and upper Egypt that are potentially sometimes waging war or they're separate regions. Sometimes they're unified and that happens all through history. So we're gonna start with that. Before we dive into Cetus and the myths behind her, so sit back, relax, and let's learn a little bit about Egypt. The goddess Cetus has connections to other gods and different personifications throughout ancient Egyptian history. It can be a bit confusing because there's so much time that spans. Let's talk about her evolution a little bit. Primarily, we talk about her from the New Kingdom. It is the period in ancient Egyptian history between the 16th century BC and the 11th century BC. So that is 1550 BC through 1100 BC. It's a very long time ago. It was one of the three golden ages of Egypt. So this is a time of growth, unification, science, art, and so much more. But her name first appears on stone jars at Saqqara, which were placed inside the lower chambers of Pharaoh Djoser's Step Pyramid this is during 2670 BCE. And if you notice, this is in Lower Egypt, very north, super north, which is crazy because she is most known and famous for being in Upper Egypt, bordering Nubia and the southern region of Aswan. Pharaoh Djoser was also in power during the Old Kingdom. She is thought to be an older goddess from the pre-dynastic period of Egypt. So that is around 6000 BCE to 3150 BCE. Already we are seeing a span of at least 3000 years. That's just her first appearance. Following, she appears in the pyramid texts during the dynasty VI. This is during the Old Kingdom, purifying a deceased pharaoh's body with four jars of water from Elephantine. So before the New Kingdom, Cetus was considered to be the spouse of the god Montu. He was a falcon god of war. 
an embodiment of the conquering vitality of the pharaoh. He was mostly worshipped in Thebes, which was the capital of Upper Egypt. Now remember, Upper Egypt means south, Lower Egypt means north, because of the flow of the Nile. Apparently, their marriage was fleeting. By the new kingdom, she replaced the goddess Hecate as the wife of Kanum, the ram-headed god who is also known as the divine potter and the god of the source of the Nile. He is a fascinating god. I love learning about him. If you want more information about him, click on one of the links below to begin. Cetus's principal center of worship was at Elephantine, or Abu, an island in Aswan, on the southern edge of Egypt. Elephantine was the capital of the state and for many years was the outer post and military stronghold of the ancient Egyptian empire. This served to defend the border of Egypt, but also as a place for commerce and trade with the Nubians. This could also be a reason for the name Elephantine because of the trading of ivory. Elephantine became the cult center for the three gods, Cetus, the war goddess of the flood, also known as Inundation, Kanum, and their daughter Anukit, who we talked about last time. She's the goddess of the cataracts. Collectively, they are known as the Elephantine Triad. Cetus' temple there occupied an early pre-dynastic site to be aligned with the star of Sirius. Set from Cetus means to eject, shoot, pour, or throw. Her name can be translated as she who shoots or she who pours. This is usually related to the flowing river current. As a warrior goddess, she was strongly associated with the annual inundation of the river Nile. Her name was originally written with the hieroglyph for a shoulder knot but this was later replaced by the sign representing a cow's skin pierced by an arrow. Cetus is usually depicted as a woman dressed in a sheath gown with the horns of an antelope, wearing the conical crown of Upper Egypt. This is also known as a hedget. Sometimes she's portrayed with a bow and arrows in her hand. Often she is shown holding an ankh, which is the symbol of life, and a scepter, which is a symbol of power. She's also shown in some places carrying jars of water that purify. Also, she can be shown with a star on her head. There are times where she is often depicted as an antelope. As a war goddess, Cetus protected Egypt's southern Nubian frontier by killing the enemies of the pharaoh with her sharp arrows. She was also 
a goddess of fertility because of her association with the river flooding. As a fertility goddess, she was thought to grant the wishes of those who sought love. Not only that, but she purified the deceased with water from the underworld, which is the mythical source of the Nile. There are documents or pyramid texts where she appears purifying a deceased pharaoh's body with four jars of water from Elephantine. Cetus's most important role was as the goddess of the inundation, also known as yearly flooding of the Nile. The flooding season, also called Akhet, usually occurred between June and September. According to myth, on the, quote, night of the teardrop, the goddess Isis would shed a single tear, which was then caught by Cetus and poured into the Nile, which caused the yearly flood. As a result, she, like Isis, over time became linked to the goddess Sothis, who is the goddess and personification of the star of Sirius A, also known as the dog star. The reason why this happened was that the star, the dog star, rose in the sky just before the arrival of the inundation every year. Cetus became the guardian of the annual flood of the Nile. There was actually a major sanctuary dedicated to Cetus on Cetus Island, and she was worshipped throughout the Aswan area of southern Egypt. The annual flood was critical to the ancient Egyptians. It was a vital part of the agricultural cycle. Over time, and in some areas, Kanum, or Cetus's husband, merges with the sun god Ra. This suggests that Cetus could have become an eye of Ra because she begins to merge with the goddess Hathor over time. I want to talk about the eye of Ra because it is really cool and very vital. The Eye of Ra is an entity in ancient Egyptian mythology that is the feminine counterpart to the sun god Ra. She's a violent force that subdues his enemies. The Eye represents an extension of Ra's power equated with the disk of the sun. Oftentimes, it behaves as an independent goddess. The eye goddess acts as mother, sibling, consort, and daughter of the sun god. She protects him against the agents of disorder that threatens his kingdom. This dangerous aspect of the eye goddess is often represented by a lioness or by a uraeus or cobra, a symbol of protection and royal authority. 
here you see the crown with the cobra. This is a common thing we do see in ancient Egyptian art, but I did not understand the vital meaning of it. Let's take a little break from ancient Egyptian history and folklore for a second and just chill until we get to the end. And here is my full front speed paint, no hands example. I wanted to be able to showcase this to you. Before I move on to explain it, I want to make a few corrections. So I said Uraeus for when we were talking about the Eye of Ra. It is actually pronounced Uraeus. And also, when I was referring to the personification of Sirius, the goddess, I said Sothis. And this is partially because I play too much Fire Emblem, but also that is the Greek pronunciation. The ancient Egyptian pronunciation is Soptet. If you want to learn more about what ancient Egyptian sounded like, I have a link for a video down below. It's really cool. So for my drawing, I wanted to include Satis facing the star of Sirius. She's holding a bow and arrow in her hand and shooting across. There's water being released from the arrow, being poured. You'll notice there are four bright circles below. Those are to represent the four jars of healing water from Elephantine. She is wearing her hepjet with antler horns. She is also wearing an ankh because in a lot of ancient Egyptian art, she is holding an ankh. The arrow is pointed at the star of Sirius, aiding her in the inundation.
hope you guys enjoyed my speed paint. I wanted to talk a little bit about my thoughts on the goddesses from the Elephantine Triad, Cetacean Anokit, because I find them so interesting and they're almost separate uh, from a lot of the other Egyptian gods. They, it's like their own little clique, their special little circle, and I find that interesting. It's interesting because Kanum and Cetus, if they're the parents of Anokit, it doesn't really talk about them having, I guess, an origin story, like parents or, you know, I guess if we we're to umbrella term it, Ra is the king of all the gods, but I mean, Kanum is actually considered to be the fathers of fathers. He's actually the one that created us, all of humankind, with clay from the potter's wheel. It's really cool. So I, I just think it's really interesting um, because we have the triad who is very clearly team Upper Egypt. They watch the Nile. It's very important to all of the agricultural cycles in all of Egypt. But because we've got a lot of separation between Upper and Lower Egypt, it definitely feels like it's a totally separate entity. And we have the other nine, the main nine gods. So we call them, call them the Ennead or Ened. So that actually means nine, it's the nine deities. Um, and they're the most popular ones. We've got Osiris, Isis, all of them. And Heliopolis is actually close and the capital of Lower Egypt, but it's closest to Greece. So a lot of our history about Egyptian gods and, and culture and myth all kind of come from there. So it's, it's interesting. So I don't know if you understand where I'm coming from, but it's kind of, we might have lost a lot of information and the people that write history are the, I mean, that's what's going to continue on throughout the, throughout time. So yeah, there's a, probably still a lot to learn about these two wonderful goddesses. If you're just as interested as I am about Egyptian history, you can go down as many rabbit holes as I did. You can start with any of the links down below. It'll, you'll go somewhere. It's like Alice in Wonderland. It's so cool and definitely let me know how all of that goes for you. I'd love to have a conversation about it. But there is a reason why we have Egyptologists. It's so complicated and really fascinating and there's still so much left unknown. So that is the final thoughts for me about Cetus and Anokit this week. Next time on my channel, we are gonna move all the way north. We're going to go to Germany now um, and look at some Slavic and Germanic myths. We're going to be focusing on the Buschfrauen or or the bush people, but we're also going to be diving into a specific entity or monster or whatever you want to call it, creature up north, and it's called the bush chromatter, which means, sorry, my German's not the best, but it means the bush grandmother. Kind of creepy. If you guys like my channel, like this content, and want to learn more about myths from all around the world, especially goddesses and heroines across the globe, make sure to subscribe and like my channel. It means a whole lot to me, and it's a great way to support me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Make sure to leave a comment down below to let me know how I'm doing. I'll make sure to see you guys next week for a new Germanic myths.